few minutes now, also a couple of minutes, um, you know, contemplate our motivation uh, for being here today. In particular, here we're cultivating uh, love and compassion. We can recognize, you know, obviously, I myself want to be happy. I don't want to suffer. Just the same as me, <coughs> uh, my loved ones, my you know, friends and family, they're exactly the same. They also want to be happy and don't want to suffer. And all the limitless strangers, people I don't know and tend not to care about, <coughs> actually they're the same. They also, just as deeply as I do, they want to be happy, want to not suffer. Even the people I don't like, <coughs> my supposed enemies, right? they're also exactly the same. They want to be happy, they don't want to no difference at all between myself, like those close to me, those I don't know, those I tend to dislike. We're all identical in wanting to be happy and wanting to not suffer. <coughs> Although I sometimes tend to feel like I'm some kind of, that my well-being is independent, the truth is that the well-being of others and the well-being of myself is interdependent. My purpose today, to contemplate myself, right? my purpose today is to leave myself, those close to me, those I don't know, and even my enemies, to happiness. That's love. That kind of wish. And to freedom from suffering. To liberation from suffering. So that's compassion. That's the purpose of my life, to leave myself and others who are numberless to happiness, to leave away from suffering. to study and contemplate, discuss the path to enlightenment, the purpose of which is to help me be able to lead myself and others along a path to both conventional and then ultimate happiness.
and uh, a motivation line. You can recite the verse that was beginning. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. To the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. To the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. To the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. <laughs> so I'm going to return to the text by Lama Tsongkhapa, the middle length long length text. And so um, we're on the first of the, two, there are like, this text teaches uh, two different methods. Um, actually, there are just two different So it teaches the two, the two different methods for generating uh, bodhicitta. And so we're about halfway through, a little more than halfway through the first method called the seven-point cause and effect method. And I'm not going to cover that again, just to remind you. Last week we covered um, yeah, equanimity, developing equanimity, and then uh, like we're rec uh, 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 meditating on beings as, as being uh, mothers, uh, remembering their kindness, and generating the wish to repay their kindness. And we, we actually went into love, the meditation on love. But I'll pick up with meditation on love. Which uh, page? Uh, I guess I'm going to start on page 142, even though we, we kind of covered that last week, but let's go through a little bit of it again. <clears throat> so Lama Tsongkhapa, you know, describes love, right, as being this, um, actually, I'll mention, so like, uh, in Buddhist psychology, a Pavonkar she mentions this in his long name, there are two different types of, of um, you know, I mean, there are many types, actually, but um, two different, like, definitions, you could say, of love. One is this like sort of feeling of affection for others, like a feeling of affection and warmth, wanting to be close to them, sort of seeing them in a positive light. Right, That's one kind of um, love. And then Lama Sukhava is emphasizing the second kind of love, which is a, um, I say right, a kind of more, even, even higher kind of uh, sense of love, which is this, this wish that others be happy. Uh, you know, the wish that somebody, that they be happy, that they sort of be fulfilled, that they um, be, you know, the best, highest, most wonderful version of, of everything possible they can be. Um, <clears throat> so Lama Sankhava, when he talks about meditation on love, he's talk, he says clearly, he says, uh, it's the thought, how wonderful it would be if they were uh, to meet with happiness. May they meet with happiness. And then this profound last one, I myself will make them, or help them, uh, to meet with happiness, right? So it's that, it's that kind of feeling. And it's not just, that, I mean, you start with a thought, but the idea is that it's a feeling, right? You go up this feeling of, like, what's the word? So it, that's found that, as, as he said, right, it's, you, you won't actually generate that state of mind unless you first feel connected to those people, right, and appreciate them. So first you have to kind of, like, feel connected to the other, pers other person or people, feel some sense of that, that kind of warmth and appreciation of them, even gratitude to them. And then you develop this wish, may they be happy. Uh, I myself right, uh, will help them and make them become happy. You know, that not that you can make somebody happy, but I'll, I'll support their happiness. I'll guide them. I'll help them. I'll, I'll do anything I can to help them become happy. Right? Um, now, first of all, like I said last week, we all know, right? That's like, you know, when you feel that from somebody else, um, we know the value of that, right? Like, it's what. You know, for us human beings, actually, um, we need that at times to survive, right? Like, it's only Dalai Lama points out. He says, actually, when you're a baby, as we went over this last week, when you're a baby, uh, human beings will die, right? If you, like, at least a turtle or something like that, can, or an alligator, you know, they can sort of scamper off and survive. Some, unless they get eaten by something else, they can, some of them can survive. Humans, zero can survive, right? Like, no baby will survive without somebody to hold it. Sounds to it, talk to it. Right? Well, all, any human being will die. Right? So we know we need, and we're at the end of life, also, right? you need love. 
he needs, you know, he's like, whatever, nobody wants to be just sort of unloved when they're old and sick or dying. And actually in the middle of life, right, we all know this also, right, like without some kind of love, um, life has not much meaning, doesn't it? Because it's, it's, um, it's that sense of loving kindness uh, and loving connection with others that gives life a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. Um, and so Lama Sankaba next, and I covered this last time, I'm just going to go briefly. He talks about the, uh, the vast merits of love. And actually, I want to make a comment on that just from my own side, like just, I mean, a reflection, not, not like my own personal, but a reflection on it. One of their benefits, he says, is he says, um, he says, by, he, he gives a list of um, eight, eight benefits or eight qualities of love. Um, <clears throat> and I, I want to, um, so I'm going to skip over the other parts. We talked about it, but um, I wanted to, we kind of stopped there, and I just wanted to say a couple things about this. So he says, if you generate love, you'll be, uh, you yourself will be loved by gods and humans. Uh, they'll protect you, uh, and you'll have mental happiness and much happiness. Uh, things won't harm you. You'll achieve your goals without effort. You'll be reborn in the world of Brahma. means like the heavenly realm. Kind of, uh, uh, and even if you don't reach liberation, you'll have these eight qualities, he says. So I just wanted to share, share like a reflection on that point. Um, you know, part of this is part of like Buddhist psychology, actually. And it's true, actually. You know, like when we cultivate, say, the opposite of love, so like, say, hatred, right? then wherever you are, like, you know, so they say hatred, right, uh, is the cause of hell, that creates hell. Um, from a karmic point of view, they would say in future lives, that's true, right? If you actions based on hatred, you, you'll be reborn in kind of terrible places. But even this life, right, if, in other words, if you've ever been somewhere, right, if you've been in a situation, if you're, like, in a room, right, where there's, it's filled with hatred, <coughs> uh, it already is hell, in a sense, right? Or, or, or you can feel the, the truth of that, right? In other words, um... If you yourself are feeling hatred, actually, um, there's something just sort of horrifying about that, actually. Right? Um, and uh, you know, and if you're in a family, let's say, or in a workplace, or in a group of people, right, where there's hatred for each other, right? if you walk in a room and the people are hating each other, right, it's um, as I say, right, like the room could be beautiful, right, like, but. You could be like in a very fancy room, um, but the feeling is as if, you know, like it doesn't matter how it looks, right? The feeling is horrible, actually, right? Like you want to leave that place. Um, unless you get caught up enough in hatred that you want to hurt somebody, then you may not want to leave, you may want to fight. But again, like if you look back on that afterwards, that's not a pleasant thing. Right, like, it's actually the way we create you know, our mind creates a kind of hell, right? So what he's saying here is that love is the opposite of that, right? In other words, when you're feeling this kind of love, right, the love where you feel the sense of warmth and affection and caring and appreciation of the other, and then you feel, you know, uh, all I want is to just help them be happy, have peace, have joy, have everything they want, you know, the sense of sort of like, it's like a, in that moment there's a sense of, I'm not talking about in some like grand spiritual sense, but there's a sense of self-transcendence, right? A sense of, of like reaching beyond oneself in a loving connection, not in some transcendental way, but like from one's heart, right? A sense of like um, going beyond the sort of small, limited, almost like paranoid sense of ego. And what Lama Sankapa here is pointing out is that um, that in and of itself is a kind of happiness. Right? I mean, actually, it's a wonderful happiness. You know? um, but and we all kind of, you know, in some sense, we know that, right? Like, or if you think of whether you think of, um, you know, if it, if you you could think of the first time you fell in love, right? Or you could think of, like, if you're a mother, right, or a parent, or something, you can think of the first time you know you held your child. Um, even the love you have for an animal, right? like um, that kind of feeling you have, right? The feeling, that feeling when you're like in the state of loving. I'm not talking about like, and I want to differentiate something. This is not when you say like, you know, if you say like, um, is there, like if I, I'm, I'm not talking about when like, for example, so with a family member, you say, oh, I love them, but they're really annoying to me right now, right? And I'm pissed off at them. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about when you're in the state of actually feeling love. Does that make sense? So it's not the theoretical idea of love, like you say, 
you know, like, yeah, I love everybody, but I can't stand them. <laughs> Right? It's when you're in that state of really feeling in your heart the sense of, of connection and warmth and wanting the other to be happy. Right? You know, and, and whether you feel that for you know, a family member or a partner or a, um, an animal or a, you know, whoever, um, you know, or your best friend. You know, so it could be, you know, there's all different versions of this, right? One's a parent, one's a child, a grandparent. Um, what he's pointing out, right, is that, first of all, in, in, the, in that moment, that's a source of great happiness, right? uh, of, of sort of, um, when you look back on your life, those are the moments, actually, that are most important, uh, the moments where you gave and received that. Right? Um, and what he's saying here, so one thing is, like, you know, and, and I, oh, I was going to say, so, and then, like, in that case, it's really true, isn't it? Like, um, Actually, for myself, I often think of that. Like, a, um, I think of uh, when I was a kid with my grandparents, there was that kind of feeling often. And our house was very simple. Like, um, it was a very simple space, you know. There really wasn't enough room for us all when we would go there. But it didn't matter. Like, I didn't notice that. Only looking back, I'm like, oh, yeah, it was kind of like, like I was sleeping in the living room, you know. It was like, but I didn't notice it as a kid because I just felt so happy to be there. Right? I felt so happy to be around them because I loved them and they loved me and there was a sense of warmth there. And it wasn't just like they loved me in the sense that they said, oh, I love you. It was like, if you felt it. And um, right, and, you, and we know that also that you could be. It doesn't matter where you are, right? If you're if you're with somebody you can't stand, you're not going to be happy. You could be at the most beautiful resort in the world, and if you're sharing a room with somebody you can't stand, you're not going to enjoy this. Right? Um, so what he's getting at is that love is the source of happiness. And the other thing he's getting at here is a few different points, right? Which is just kind of obvious in a way, right? Is that the more you live in that state of actually loving. Right? I'm not saying like, oh, you know, again, I'm just trying to differentiate. There are a lot of people who will say, oh, I love lots of people. But that, you know, but that's words. You know, what he's getting at here is it has to be like in your heart. And so what he's saying is, right, if you're in that state, first of all, in that moment, you're joyful, you're self-transcendent, you're happy. You know? And then what he's getting at is, over time, the more you habituate yourself to that state of mind, the more joyful and happy you'll be. Um... And then he's making these points. Others will also love you, right? Or is it that that's the natural result of that? You know, we could say karmically it's a result of it. It's true. But even it's true actually in this life, right? Like in other words, if you're in, the, in an obvious way, right? If you go around being extremely loving to people, you know, Ken Shurimche, I think I said this, Ken Shurimche would sometimes say, um, the best way to subdue somebody, like a difficult person, is to love them. Um, of course, the idea is that you don't, you're not really subduing them in the sense of conquering them, but they're no longer your enemy if you love them, right? Like, uh, you subdue them in that sense. They're no longer your enemy because you love them. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's what he's getting at here. And he's saying, um, you'll be protected, right? You'll be protected in the sense that, if, you know, um, let's see, let's see this right. Like, actually, in the sense that your own love, first of all, protects you, right? It protects your mind from being uh, miserable. And it also builds relationships, right? They actually have done studies on this. You know, I just was reading it again. Like, actually, I thought that was, uh, now I'm going on a little bit of a tangent from the Buddhist teachings for a moment, but. Um, you know, actually, I thought this was interesting. They did like a statistical meta-analysis, a psychologist did, and they, they showed that um, isolation and loneliness are, in the research, are worse, for, they cause death uh, more, more quickly, like they're worse than smoking. For you. Like, so they did a comparison, you know, like they always thought, oh, smoking is like terrible right, for your health, which is true. But loneliness and disconnection from others is worse for your health, for health actually. You'll die faster. You know, people who report their own experience being lonely moment to moment, um, it shortens your life. It's like, you know, so, whereas uh, the best predictor, and actually the best predictor, you know, love, first of all, is a predictor of health. It's a predictor of better relationships, of course. It's a predictor of better marriages. It's a predictor of happier family. You know, so, in other words, love gives rise, you know, like, um, and actually it doesn't cost anything. You don't even have to go to the doctor, right? To have, to have love. <laughs> uh, so part of what it's getting at, you know, is <clears throat> love leads to all kinds of positive results. And of course, from a Buddhist point of view, first of all, that's true in this life, it's true in that, pre it's true in the moment that you're feeling it, it's true over the course of your lifetime, and according to Buddhism, it's true also in your future lives. Right? In other words, the more you act loving in this life, the better future life you have. So that's the Buddhist perspective on that. Right? And then, uh, I said this last week, I'll just mention it again. Then, uh, then Lama Tsongkhapa points out, he says, you know, that he tells that story, he mentioned it briefly, about how the Buddha... Right before he achieved enlightenment, he was like attacked, right, by the 
demons of Mara, uh, who were going to try to block his enlightenment. And he medita- he, he, uh, in order to, let's see, his response to, his, to that attack was to meditate on uh, infinite love. They say he co- so he conquered the sort of adversary through the power of love, right? and there's that beautiful story. Then he touched the earth, right? The, the earth bear, bore witness to his love and, and compassion, uh, which was, <coughs> and then, uh, and then you know, then the sun rose and he became the Buddha. Um, <coughs> and so then, uh, then he points out. So when you're meditating on love, um, begin with those close to you because it's easier. So begin with the people you, you ordinarily would say, oh, I love them, right? or I like them at least, and then you know, cultivate this deep sense of love for them. And he says, once your mind becomes familiar with that, then expand it to neutral people, people you don't really know, and, inc- and start to include them in that sense of love. Uh, once you've gotten familiar with that, then you turn uh, to the, uh, even the enemies, the people you don't like, and then expand it to all beings. And obviously you do that in that order. I mean, Lama Tsongkhapa and the Buddha, Buddhist teachers uh, are put in that order, not because for some philosophical reason, for a practical reason, right? Like, in other words, everybody knows it's harder to cultivate love for your enemy than it is for your friend, right? You know, for your loved one. So you build up to the enemy, right? Because there's a recognition that's harder. But the idea here is that if you don't, you know, I, I, we went over equanimity in, in other words, but if you don't include your enemies in your loving kindness, um, then it won't really develop, actually. Actually, that's where, you know, from a practice point of view, from a spiritual point of view, uh, from an inner training point of view, actually, uh, you have to be able to include your enemies uh, in your practice of love, or your love won't really develop. And actually, it's, the other thing is true, actually, is if you don't include your enemies within the scope of your love, then your loved ones will eventually become your enemies anyway. Right? Like, because you'll be that, you know... Because actually, without, if you don't include your enemies, then your love is based on your own egotism still, right? Or like, I love them because they're nice to me. And as soon as they stop being nice to me, then I'm not going to love them anymore. You know, so then like, that's how, you know, like, um, as I say it. So otherwise, it's kind of a, what's the word, like a weak or a superficial love, right? I love people when they're, you know, when they do what I want, I really love them. You know, that, that's not real love anyway, right? So if you can't, you know, so that's important. You have, I mean, you know, you might say, I don't want to include my enemies. But actually, like, you know, if you, if you have, like, let's say, um, you know, whether you have, like, a partner or a deep friendship or a, a child, right, um, you know, there are going to come times when that person who you're trying to love will do things you don't like, right? And if you haven't meditated on the ability to love people who are doing annoying things to you, then you'll hurt them. So this ability to meditate, you know, so in other words, actually, this is what, you know, like Shanti Deva says, oh, my enemy is so helpful to me, right? And he says, I need enemies uh, to help me in my spiritual practice, because then I can meditate on love for them, right? That's what he's getting at. And there is, is that there, you know, this training and meditating on love for one's enemy, for the person who's hurting oneself or harming oneself or one doesn't like, is incredibly important, right? Because there is, without that, our love stays sort of um, egotistical. It's like sort of phony love or pseudo love. It's a, it's a love that's based on, you know, well, you're being nice to me, so I'll love you, you know, that kind of thing. Rather than, um, rather than a kind of power, powerful love includes um, includes people. You know, it's like a love that um, that can embrace the other regardless of what the other's doing in that moment. Makes sense. Warren? Yeah. Is there a? I, mean, I missed the last week. Uh, is there a section preceding this where he makes an attempt to define the word <clears throat> love? Uh, and actually, he defines it here as uh, the wish that others be happy. On, on, uh, where he says the aspect of love, so it's the thought, how wonderful it would be. You know, um, I think you might say that somewhere else as well, but I go into more detail, but uh, that's, that's the definition here. So it's this thought, um, may others be happy. In this context, that's the way he um, and then he points out one last point, and this will conclude the section on, on uh, love and move to compassion, uh, where he says, so one, you know, when you actually are meditating on love, then you also have to focus on, you have to see others from the perspective of um, how they lack happiness. Right? Um, 
you know, so we already have, you know, and, and at this point, I just want to point something out. Like, at this point, you can't do this, med you don't do this meditation until you've medit done the other ones first, right? So you already have this sense of gratitude and connection to others through the previous meditation, meditating on others and the aspect of being a mother, remembering the kindness and we should repay the kindness. You have a sense of already feeling connected to others, right? And so this is the idea. Once you feel connected to others in this way and affectionate to others, you contemplate, you, just the truth, you contemplate how how they don't have everything internally and externally that they need to truly be happy. Does that make sense? And as you contemplate that, you start to wish for them to have those things. Right? Um, because if you just say, if you kind of view others as already happy, you won't develop much love for them. Right? But, and so, um, in this sense, you're not trying to develop love for the Buddha. Right? Uh, you know, we're not focusing on something like the Buddha. We're focusing on, on sentient beings. It's not just people, because it includes uh, non-humans also. So, but sentient beings, creatures, you know, beings who lack either, you know, they could, and he says here, they can lack, you can meditate on how they lack what he calls contaminated happiness, that means the ordinary happiness of life, or uncontaminated happiness, meaning the happiness of enlightenment itself. Right? And so you, you, you have to first feel a sense of cherishing others or caring about others, and then you meditate on the sense of, well, they don't have everything they need to be happy. And in that way, you develop this feeling uh, and experience of love. Um, and then he points something out, which I think is actually, he, it's a very small line here, um, but he, he says, uh, actually, I'm going to read these two sentences, because I think they're very important. They're very simple, but they're very important, I think, just from, for, at least for me, they have been, so they may be for you, too. He says, this point is, once you have familiar, familiarized yourself with this, the wish for them to meet with happiness will arise naturally. That's the first sentence. Then the second sentence. In addition, Having directed your mind to the various kinds of happiness, you will then provide sentient beings with them. Right? So what he's saying there is a couple of really important points. First one is, you're not going to become more loving if you don't familiarize yourself with it. Right? Whereas if you don't actually like, steep your mind over and over again in these kinds of contemplations, then you won't become more loving, and um, you'll just sort of, it'll just be words. Does that make sense? You won't become, it won't fill your heart. That's the first point. And then he makes another point here where he says, right, once you've done that, once that starts to arise naturally, then your behavior, you'll naturally start doing things, right? You'll do, you start doing acts of love, and they'll come, they'll flow from within you, right, in a natural way. And um, that's usually, and, and it'll be a great source of joy in your life. Does that make sense? That's the implication there. And that's important because, like, I think I've, maybe I've, some of you might. I've said this before, but I'll just say because I was so busy. Like I remember the year, years and years ago, I was like many years ago, I was working with like I had a job working with disabled children, and I was um, going to school, and I was I was and I was trying to practice meditation as well at the time. But I was very busy doing those things, and then I read this line from Lama Zopa where he said, you know, basically he said when you when you cherish others from your heart and develop loving kindness, great joy will arise. Like real joy will start, real happiness will begin in your life. And I remember reading that line and thinking, I'm totally stressed out. Like, I don't really feel that happy. Um, and I was like, what's wrong with me or something? Like, you know. And then I realized, like, what I realized was I was doing this in the reverse order. I was trying to act loving, but my heart wasn't full of love. I wasn't actually experiencing love. I was just, I mean, not that I wasn't at given moments, but not most of the time. Most of the time I was just thinking, like, oh, i got to do this, and i got to do that, and I'm in a hurry, and i got five more things to do, and, you know, why is this person doing this stupid thing, and why is the other person being like that, and... Um, you know, so my mind was on those kind of topics, right? But I thought I was doing the, the actions, right? I was, I was doing actions trying to provide others with happiness, but I wasn't actually feeling love for them. I was feeling stressed out and concerned and maybe sometimes annoyed and sometimes judgmental and sometimes, right? And I was like, yeah, I don't really feeling happy. And then I had to, like, look at myself and be like, oh, I'm doing it wrong. Like, I'm just not, I'm actually not that loving. I'm pretending I am or I'm, like, acting like I am, but I'm not actually being it, you know what I mean? And then, so I was like, oh, th this point that Lama Sankaba is making is psychologically very important, right? Whereas the emphasis is first actually develop love, right? And then let it flow naturally in your behavior. Does that make sense? Um, so I think it's a very profound point because otherwise, like, I don't know how to say it right. Otherwise we can be busy and not really be experiencing the, you know, like, it's not actually it's, well put it this way you know that's not the source of happiness for one thing and it's not the source of um, 
spiritual development, it's not the source of enlightenment, that's just some other thing, right? It's like, I always think sometimes that's like self-image management or something like that. It's, ego, it's another version of egotism. Um, whereas love is not about this. It's about a genuine sense of, of feeling connected to others and wanting others to be happy and cherishing them in your heart. It makes sense. It's actually it's like a rule of thumb. I'm going off on a slight tangent here. But it's actually disturbing in a way. If you're not feeling... So one of the implications here is if you're not feeling a deep sense of peace or happiness or joy or uh, kind of purposeful, sense of purposeful purpose and happiness, then you're not being loving yet. Right? Like that's the implication of what Lama Sokap was saying. So it's a good guideline for it. In other words, if I'm feeling stressed out and annoyed, and then I must not be being loving. It's good to know that. You know, uh, it's like, you know, it's a self, like a self-honesty thing, right? Because a lot of times, I mean, people, you know, not, not everybody, some people say, oh, no, I don't care, I'm you know, pissed off or whatever, but, but a lot of times people will say, oh, yeah, I'm a loving person, I, I love, you know, I love this person, I love that person. But we have to check, on our, we have to be honest with ourselves, right? Like, do I love them, or do I feel some sense of, you know, like, connection to them, and making, and that they're supposed to then support my sense of ego by doing what I think they should do? You know, that's not love. Or like, you know, am I sort of staying connected to them because that like reinforces my sense of my role in the world or something like that? Again, that's not love, right? Love is, uh, you know, that's why it was good you asked the question, right? What's the definition of love, right? So this sense, love is this deep wish that others be joyful, be happy, be fulfilled, be have, like, you know, have joy and peace and, you know, everything good in their lives, right? So when we have that, it's a sense of great joy and then it will flow naturally. And one last point I'll make about that is, also if you think in your own life, right? Like, do you, I don't know if you have, like, if you try to think of, like, the experience when you, either you gave that to somebody else or they gave it to you, right? Like, like that sense of love, like where you felt like totally like, it's like this experience where like, the person, both people feel incredibly lucky. You know what I mean? Like, the giver feels, like the person who's helping the other person, who's trying to help them be happy, feels just as joyful as the person who's receiving it. Does that make sense? Um, both people feel blissed out. Um, right? And the, this idea like, is that um, if you cultivate just love, we're going to get to even more now. We're gonna, about to go into even more positive things. But just this, right? if you just cultivate love, you'll be an incredibly happy person, whatever happens to you. So Lord, so uh, if so, meditating on love is a prerequisite for meditating on compassion. Actually, Lawrence Sankal makes a point. He says, um, he's, and I, I mentioned this last week. So he, he says, uh, in in actual practice, if you meditate first on the sense of uh, in this one, if you meditate on the mother beings and so on, you know, you develop this sense of affection and warmth to others. He says, in real life, uh, compassion or love can arise in either order. He actually says that. And he says, the reason being, if you feel deeply, con let's say like you've meditated on the sense of deep connection to somebody else, right? Like pick one person for you, just to start. Like, so, so I'm feeling a deep sense of connection to them. Ordinarily, it would be love first. But let's say that happens and then they get some kind of terrible disease. Right? <laughs> well, then compassion is going to come first. You know, because you're going to feel, oh my goodness, I feel, you know, like I, I feel the sense of wanting to relieve them from that. And so in real, he's making this point psychologically or in, in real life, where he's saying it depends partly on what you focus on. Like in other words, if you focus on oh, they don't have every happiness, you know, I want them to be happy, then love will come. But if you suddenly, if your attention suddenly shifts to some kind of deep suffering they're having, then without any choice, compassion will arise, you know. Um, so it, it, he, he points this out. He says, in real, in real practice, in any given moment, yeah, they can come in either order. But I'll share my own reflection on that point, too, which is, this is not Lama Scott, it's my, myself, but... Um, I think the reason they put them in the order of first love and then compassion is if you think about it, like the wish for others to be happy, you can, st like I was saying this last week a little bit, like you don't have to focus on the dark, the darkness, in a way, the suffering, the, the, the worst kinds of suffering that the other is experiencing. So compa this is, it, let me bring shapes to this, compassion requires more bravery, it requires more courage. So, like, I think the reason that, that, I think the reason that the Buddha and Buddhist teachers put love first before compassion is that it doesn't require as much courage, you know. Because, like, let's say I'm thinking about others, right? I'm thinking about, like, 
you know, it's like, so for example, if I'm thinking of like, you know, I can think of, um, let's see, say, like, I'll give an example. If I think of like my niece and nephew, right, I can think, uh, like, nephew here. Um, I can think like, they're low, they're low kids, you know, I can think like, oh, I hope they're happy, I hope they have everything, I hope they have really wonderful lives, I hope they get a good, you know, good friendships and good education and good opportunities and everything good for them, right? You know, and that's like, there's, it's naturally a pleasant feeling. Whereas with compassion, to give an example, like, compassion is more like you have to be willing to go visit the hospice, you know, like, to look in the children's cancer ward, you know, to look in the, to look at, like, the, you know, to look at people when they're really in the depths of suffering. Compassion has to include that, right? So you have to be, have a kind of bravery that's willing to face that kind of, the harsher, most, the harsher or the more painful aspects of suffering. It gives it. It also gives a deep sense of, of purpose and joy and meaning to one's life. But, but I think it requires more bravery. So I think from a psychological, like, practical point of view or something like that, it makes sense to start with love first, as in terms of general training, right? Because when you're gonna, if you're going to meditate on it for hours and hours, right, it's it's easier to meditate in a way on love, right, where you're just sort of thinking, oh, may they be happy. They don't have everything they need. They're not yet enlightened. You know, may they become enlightened, right? Whereas when you turn to compassion, you're having to think. You know, uh, about, um, you know, for example, you know, the sufferings of hell beings when you say they be free from them. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit, it requires some more bravery. Sometimes you want to, others turn away. You don't want to face anything like that. Um, so I think that's why they go in that order, personally. Mm -hmm. um, that, that does fit with what Reed Rimshi said, actually, which I think of it, because he used to say that. He used to say, compassion requires a kind of courage. Um, and I don't think, you know, love is, love requires some courage, but not as much as compassion in that sense. I think. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other questions about the meditation on love? Because then we'll move into compassion. Meditation on compassion. I'm not sure if it's a question. I'm trying to think of how to say it, but it's like a, I guess there's a reason why it's like at this part of the, the text as opposed to like the beginning, but it's uh, you know, for people who are in like, uh, I was thinking about people who are in like abusive relationships and have like maybe a distorted sense of love and where it's like one person wants to fulfill all the other person's wishes, but it's a very, you know, very destructive sense of that. So it's not, <laughs> clearly not that, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Like, and that, that's one point, right? Like, that's, what, that's part of the reason I said, if you're not feeling peaceful and happy and joyful, then according from the Buddhist perspective, then it's not really love, right? It's an interesting point. Because love is this feeling, right? Of, like, love by its very nature has a kind of sense of, what's it say, right? Of, uh, what's her, uh, of energy and positivity and even like joy, happiness uh, to it. So, in that case, one has to kind of analyze. You know, for the, for any given, I mean, every people are different. Each person is a little different from any other person. But there are these versions where it's like, you know, what's there say right? Where the person, you know, sometimes it's out of fear, right? I, I have, to, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to not do this. Sometimes it's out of a sense of, um, what's there say right? You know, habituation to a certain role. Relationally, right, a codependent role or something like that. But um, yeah, but if the person's feeling, let's say, say right, you have to. I mean, the person, every person has to look in their own heart, right. But I mean, but if you if you look here, what they're getting at, what this is getting at, if a person is in a place where they're feeling, um, what is there to say right, either fearful or Depressed or um, stuck or um, what's there to say right? Or also that I guess I'll make one more point related to what you're saying. Also, because this is actually a hard one. It's not in this text actually. We'll teach it here, but in other texts they make this point. That also we have to be able to differentiate love from a kind of grasping grasping attachment or grasping desire kind of state. And that those are two different states of mind <coughs> that um, that can be confused sometimes in people's own experience. And uh, and one point that Buddhism is making is that, you know, if a person, what if you, if for any of us, you know, including in the kind of examples you're giving, which are more extreme in any, in any case, if we fall into a state of grasping, you know, sort of grasping at the other uh, with a kind of kind of grasping desire, a 
attachment state or something like um, it can it, we can mistake that for love and in our I think in our language in our culture they're not differentiated necessarily like you know but Buddhist psychology does differentiate those very strongly and clearly um, and so but one difference there is this is in the state when we're in the state of desire actually we have to differentiate it actually you know in ourselves through introspection but remember like in so first of all, if a person's in a state of fear, that's not love. Right? Whereas if you're relating to somebody else through fear, that's obviously not love. But if you're relating to somebody else through the sign of grasping at them, it's interesting, right? Like in both cases, you could say, like, you know, because if you looked at somebody else from the outside and somebody, somebody was just grasping at somebody else, you would say, oh, they love them. You might say that. You might look and say, oh, look, that looks like love. But from an introspective point of view, here's the difference, right? In the state of grasping, right, like, there is this feeling of, I need this other for me to be happy. Right? Like, that's actually the inner state, right? This is, there's an inner state of, I need them or I'm not going to be happy, so they better, I, they better stay near me or I better do whatever I have to to manipulate them so that they'll do what I need, you know, um, or, or so I'll be okay or something like that. I won't be okay without them. So I have to sort of um, do this or do that to stay connected to them so they won't leave me or they won't hurt me or they won't abandon me or they won't whatever. Like... And so if you see that, it's like, oh, okay, that's not what this is talking about, right? This is talking about an inner feeling of, um, of like, feeling warmth, feeling uh, appreciation, feeling um, gratitude to the other, and then wishing that other happiness, right? So if you look at it from, it's interesting, because from an external point of view, like, if you looked at one, one person who's over here, right, who's, like, feeling a sense of grasping at their, their partner, let's say, and somebody else over here, you might, I mean, if you weren't looking carefully, you might not be able to tell the difference, right? Like, in terms of behavior. Actually, I, I personally think if you, if you can see the person's eyes as, and their face carefully as they're doing it, then you probably could tell the difference, actually. Um, but, you know, if you, if you were at a distance where you can't see the facial expression, you might not be able to tell the difference, actually. Um, but one thing is, I, I personally believe that, that if you're really looking at the person's face and eyes, you probably can't tell the difference. The more, that's not that important. What's really important is that everyone has to tell the difference inside ourselves, each of us, you know. Um, and to recognize, okay, like, what I, you know, like in some moments, oh, what I'm calling love is actually this sort of grasping. And again, like, with grasping, there's two things. One is, love is focused on joyfully wanting the other to be happy. Whereas grasping is focused on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use a strong word here and say manipulate, but I'm going to sort of, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing to get them to make me happy. That's one difference. Right? Um, and, you know, another difference in a way is that, like, love in that sense is this kind of, I mean, the love that, this kind of love that Lama Sokhava is talking about is, you know, actually is really, you know, I'm using a different, again, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but it's, in a sense, it includes a kind of deep sense of sorry, respect, I guess. You know, like, or a, like a, a sense of, um, yeah, a sense of respect. Whereas in the other, actually, in relationships like what you're describing, right? Like, in a sense, there's a mutual lack of respect. Right? Like, in other words, um, you know, obviously, like, if, if, for example, if somebody's being, um, Say it right. Like, you know, there's not an, uh, there's not enough. Um, let's see, say it right. I'm trying to think how to say this in the right way. Like, is it like this? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, there, is it like they're both afraid in a way? It's just they're playing different roles, kind of. Yeah, isn't it? A bit like that. I mean, again, it depends on the person. I mean, there are different relationships. I don't want to sort of lump everybody together and assume it's all the same, but. Um, but there's not this recognition, or there's not this sort of recognition, there's a lack of maturity. You know, maybe that's the word I'm using. Like, that this kind of love also requires a kind of, in the moment, I'm not talking about it's like one's age, but in that given moment, the person's kind of, they, later on, you'll, you'll see, we're going to get into another, se in the next section, actually, they call, um, they differentiate between childish beings and unchildish beings. And, and, uh, and they make this point that, like, there is, if one is genuinely being loving, a sense of maturity, actually. And, it and, you know, you could be, it doesn't matter on the age. Again, it's not a chronological age issue. But, and I think what they're getting at is that, like, childish beings, in, the, in this sense, that 
um, you know, it's like really, it's relating with in an immature way or in a way that's like without without wisdom. Again, I'm sort of hesitating because I don't want to kind of lump everybody together. I, they're all different versions of, of unhealthy relationships. <laughs> and so I don't want to sort of assume that they're all the same or something either. But um, You know, actually, I'll just share a brief story, if it's okay. A, a friend of, actually, it was a, a, a Tibetan, a Tibetan friend of mine. Who I remember, you know, like, uh, to me this was an example of mature love, just like gets at the point you're getting. So it's just a very brief story. I remember this. Um, she was, a, 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 I mean, I, I knew her at the time. She was a, a woman who was who was being abused by her husband. He had been sort of, um, he had somehow gotten, you know, in Tibet he had gotten sort of abused himself uh, through the because he was Tibetan and there were all the reasons that Tibetans get abused and and had gotten um, and had sort of lost his. He had sort of become communist and become sort of caught up in some of their stuff and really got kind of became a pretty dark person and, and uh, after a while started abusing her when they moved to the US I don't know if he was abused before that or not I remember this like I thought she was I think she was a very mature loving person that she recognized that was not like she recognized what was happening she went to others for support and she left it you know um, I don't, and, she, and I was like oh she's being loving but she's leaving me. and then there came a point later when he had uh, cancer and was dying and I remember this, I was so touched. She, she showed up and helped him die, helped him die peacefully. And I was like, oh wow. Where she left him out of love, and then when he was dying, she helped him out of love. And I was like, oh, that's mature. You know, like, uh, you know, she didn't stay around and spend, you know, spend years and years longer being abused by him, because that wasn't going to help her, it wasn't going to help him. But there's a real sense of, she still, you know, like, but she cared about him. And I was like, oh, that's mature. You see what I'm getting at? I was like, oh, well, that's mature. That's healthy. Um, I, was, I was also quite touched uh, to, to see somebody to say, be willing to be that lovingly present with the person who had treated them badly. But she was mature. Does that make sense? I was like, I'm using her as an example. That's, you know, and to me, that was an example where I looked at it and I said, oh, that's, you know, that's not some kind of codependent, um, fearful, childish pattern it's like each, each step of the, along the way you know first she tried to fix things with him then when she couldn't she left him then when he was dying in a need she showed up again I was like that's mature um, that, that's I was just like a real example of what I was getting at. I think I think I explained it because I wasn't sure if like I forget if like anywhere in the text it kind of like explains like steps or like stages to like understand yourself before you get to a point where you're and I imagine since it's in this section of the book, like uh, there's <laughs> stuff you have to learn before you get to the point where it's like you're able to like, cultivate this type of love. Yeah, and this is partly why Lama Sokapa does, you know, I mean, that's what his point when he's at the very beginning where he says, I'm going to go step by step, and you're not, you know, he doesn't start with, you know, even though, and he makes that point at the beginning where he says, you know, bodhicitta is the ultimate, uh, the most important point in all the teachings. But then he, point, he points out, he says, so cultivate it briefly as you cultivate, as you actually focus on these earlier points. But don't cultivate it mainly until you get to the right <laughs> state. You know, because it's not, I mean, in other words, he's making this point, like, in other words, we think about bodhicitta all along all the stages of the path. But we don't really develop it fully until we get to this stage because we're not mature enough. Yeah. What happens when, uh, I mean, I work with children, when this child is the one showing mature love and the adult is the one because I've seen children that are the most compassionate beings I've ever experienced in life, mm-hmm. and then they're under a person who is like the opposite. What are your thoughts on that? It's interesting, isn't it? Like, I mean, I get what you mean. I've yeah, had that same experience. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a couple of things. Like, like one is one thing I think personally, and and well, that would fit with the Buddhist perspective too. Is first of all, like you know, if, if you, you know. I know you, I mean, you're, you're in this role then of a helper, yeah. it is, and somebody outside that, mm-hmm. you know, the family system or something. I think one thing is like to really, for the child, like there is it can I think it can be quite helpful. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, to point out, you know, to, to do two things at the same time in a way. One is to really honor, like to honor, like how beautiful their spirit or their heart is, you know, because 
to say, right? Like, you know, like there is a, it's important, it, just on a human level and on a, on a spiritual level, even, it's important to sort of acknowledge how wonderful, mm -hmm. like, love is. And, and that the fact that they're being loving is mm -hmm. a beautiful, wonderful thing. So to honor that, well, at the same time, I think there's an appropriate sort of, um, because I think if one just honored that, it could sort of imply, therefore, that's your job, to take care of the adults, which is also not really their job. So I think at the same time, one also has to sort of um, either let them know that's not their job, or also like sort of help, you know, help, which I think is probably what you're doing, but help relieve them of the responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a, I think it's a fine distinction to help uh, draw for a child, because it's hard, it's hard for even for adults to realize that. But to sort of draw this distinction where you can, the person can hopefully come away realizing the fact that they're loving and kind and have love in their heart is a beautiful, wonderful thing that they should never lose and should keep developing and keep increasing. And at the same time, like, you know, there's this goal of them being able to also be playful and mm -hmm. relax and feel safe and not, and not have to feel like they have to do that mm -hmm. um, to be safe, but that they can be safe as a child. You know, and, and to me, that's a hard distinction, but... I, but I think, uh, for me, I, oftentimes, it's the focus is on safety. Like, because you know, mm -hmm. when kids feel safe, they can be loving, mm -hmm. but don't feel like they have to be in order to be okay or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Whereas I think the other is like this feeling of, I also have to sustain that all the time or I'm not safe. And, th and that, of course, that leads to kind of yeah. um, all kinds of problems. Then. Does that make sense? I don't yeah. know. Is, is there more? Is that, I don't know. Is there, you have yeah, more thoughts just, on that? I don't know. It's just like it, that's what sprung in my head of like, mm -hmm. I've seen this, as you said, not age related in such a reverse. Yeah. And even when it's like, there's times where it's been inappropriate. So I worked in a pediatric oncology unit. So it was times where like the child was able to deal with their own suffering better than the parent did. Yeah. So it's like there's so many ways of seeing it and just kind of reflecting on how the beauty should be that rather than just what I experienced when I was there. Yeah, well, no, I've noticed that too. Actually, often, there's that, that's often true, isn't it? With kids who are really sick, for example, mm -hmm. will help their parents understand. How to be accepting and how to be uh, wise in the face of that. And I guess the, the other thing, I'll, um, this I, I'm not as a, I'm talking purely from a Buddhist perspective, yeah. now, not from a therapeutic point of view, but therapy point of view. But you know, is you know sometimes it can be um, true also that uh, I'm gonna say it right. There is like just because somebody's, in, I mean. You know, differentiating something. Like, on the one hand, there are moments where, like, you know, in neglect, for example, where even if the parent is not mature, uh, they need to get over it and yeah. get mature, you know, <laughs> because they have a responsibility. That's one issue, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's a different issue, which is, um, you know, that just because one person's an adult and another's a child doesn't mean that the person who's a child isn't more spiritually mature, mm -hmm. you know, uh, from past lives, from a Buddhist perspective. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there are times where that's also true, you know, like, that you know, I don't know, that's, I mean, some people who, are, you know, even as a young child have more, um, what's the word, like, they have a wisdom and compassion that comes from their past life training. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that from a Buddhist perspective, it's actually useful to acknowledge that, the truth of that, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, there's some people who are, you know, live a long life and never <laughs> develop mm -hmm. those qualities in this lifetime. Um, and there are other people who come in with that, and that's really the Buddhist perspective also, is that we all come in with our past habits, I guess, and, uh, and you know, some people have really trained themselves in compassion a lot, and others uh, not as much, and, and that's also real. Um, and I think sometimes, like, I've had this experience actually with young people too, like, somebody who has, let's say somebody who has that very strongly, but is in a family where that's not mm -hmm. honored or noticed or something like that, is there can be a real gift just in having somebody sort of notice and appreciate it, mm -hmm. um, and honor it or something because it can be hard, you know, to, to, if you're sort of somebody who tends <coughs> towards, say, compassion, but is in a family where that's not noticed or valued. Um, sometimes it's true, like where aggression is what's valued, for example. And then to have at least somebody to say, hey, wait a second, this is really wonderful that you have this, and, and to sort of reinforce that or encourage mm -hmm. it. Okay, now I'll move on to compassion, meditating on compassion in the next section. Um, so the first point Lama Sakama makes is he says, 
you know, he says, uh, he calls it the observed object. It means who are you looking at when you're feeling compassion? Uh, and he says, anyone who's suffering. So, and that's actually, you know, it's, it's a valid point from a Buddhist perspective, because they say, um, there's a point, don't, you know, uh, you don't need to focus, develop, don't, 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 don't meditate on compassion for the Buddha. He doesn't, uh, he or she doesn't need compassion. Uh, that's not the object of his compassion. So, it's a, it's a being who suffers, and he says here, any of the three kinds of suffering, right? So, the, and you remember those from uh, the teaching on the uh, middle scope of wandering, right? So, the suffering, the obvious suffering of suffering, you know, like a clear suffering, the suffering of change, Right? And the all pervasive suffering. So anyone who's still in, so in other words, this means anyone who's still in samsara, you can meditate on this uh, form on compassion. And then he says the aspect of so he's, he's next thing he's saying is so the person who's meditating on compassion, what are they thinking? And again, it's similar love, but but slightly different. So it's if only they were free from suffering. Right? That's the first one, first thought. So he's, you're looking at others who are suffering. You're thinking if only they were free. Right? Then it gets a little stronger, and you think may they be free. You know, so the first, you get the difference. The first one is very passive, right? Oh, may everybody be free from suffering. Wouldn't that be nice, right? The second one is a little more active. Well, may they be free. You know what I mean? Like, you're starting to get more an active sense of compassion, a little stronger. And then the third is much stronger. I will free them from their suffering, right? That one has a lot more energy and bravery uh, to it. But any of those is a valid version of compassion. It's just one, you know, each one is a little more powerful uh, than the one before it, right? Um, you know, if, 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 if you yourself, say, were drowning, of course, you prefer the third, right? Versus <laughs> I myself will free them from the, you, Like, I mean, it's okay if somebody's thinking, oh, may they be free from their suffering of drowning, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you can hope that there's somebody there who has the third kind, right? Who says, may I free them from, um, you know, so they're, they're, but each one's valid, but the last one's stronger. Uh, the sequence here is the same as with love, right? So you start with compassion for your friends or close family, close people, people you like. Uh, next, you do it towards neutral people who you don't uh, don't know. And the la uh, third third is uh, towards enemies, right? Uh, so you develop compassion for your enemy. And finally, towards all sentient, he says here, all sentient beings of the ten directions. Right? So the four cardinal directions, the four intermediate, up and down. So everywhere you can, in words, all directions. Ten directions in Buddhist context means everywhere. So that's the order. So, and that's important. And um, I said this last time. I think it's where that comes. Yeah, I'll, mention, I'll just mention it again here. It's an important point here that Lama Sankalpa is making. And I just want to emphasize it, which is um, when you meditate on compassion, right? He's saying he's pointing this out. You have to start with real people in your own life. Does that make sense? So it's not enough to just say, "May everyone be free from suffering." May all beings be free from suffering. How wonderful be of all beings and people. So, it's like that's fine. It's like it's not something bad with that, but that's not that's not what he's suggesting. That's not the real way of training your mind. The reason being is that if you do that, you'll generate some kind of like how can I say right. If you actually do that, you'll generate some sort of vague sense of mind, like oh, may everyone be free from suffering, you know, like that. And then as soon as a real person comes along, you won't actually apply it. <laughs> so. Because, uh, you know, you'll pass right by strangers thinking, oh, may everyone be free from suffering, and you won't notice the stranger who's suffering. You know, uh, you'll be thinking, oh, may everyone be free from suffering, and then somebody will treat you badly, and you'll uh, attack them, you know, like, uh, if not physically, verbally, or whatever, or through your facial expression. So it, it's not enough. In other words, what you have to really do is focus on specific people. Does that make sense? And by focusing on specific people in these different categories, what will happen, and then applying it to all things, <coughs> your mind will actually, it'll work. Does that make sense? It'll work psychologically, it'll work spiritually, it'll change your actual mind. And that's why, like, this is point, uh, you know, I often, uh, uh, there's a funny story about Atisha, right, who was a great, actually, who was one of the lineage masters of this teaching. He was one of the great masters, right, where he came to Tibet with this Indian guy. He was from India, you know, and he came with this other Indian, so they were together. And the Atisha was a saint, like this wonderful, compassionate person. And the other guy was, like, incredibly annoying, you know, like, really obnoxious, like, nobody could stand him. And he traveled around with Atisha for quite a while in Tibet. And then after a while, finally, Atisha said to him, okay, now you can go back. The guy, like, never liked, he didn't like anywhere, I guess. You know, he was always complaining. And so finally, like, he kept saying, I don't want to stay here. And finally, Atisha said, all right, go back to the monastery. That's fine. You're, you're, I don't need you anymore. It's okay. And then, like, after he left, the Tibetans said to Atisha, like, why did you keep that guy around for so long? He was, like, a 
annoying. You know, it's like, really? Always complaining, obnoxious, telling people off. Like, and so Atisha said, um, I needed him to help with me, me with my spiritual practice. You know, I needed somebody to put in the category of the difficult person. And he said, but now that I've gotten to know you Tibetans, I don't need him anymore. <laughs> uh, which was very funny. I sometimes think, now that Tibetans can say that about us, I do. I wonder if they laughed when they heard that. <laughs> And so um, the point, so this point, right, we need, like if you're really going to train your mind, you need to have people in these, like, you need to really make it visceral, like with real people. Does that make sense? So you, like, you don't just think some generic person, but you actually bring up, you know, like, so you bring up the, like the person, you know, the person you walk by who you didn't, you know, like the person you walk by and didn't care about, right? The person you go, where you go, wow, I really didn't, like, you know, that was a real person. Or like that animal, right? I walked by this animal and I totally ignored it, like it did, like as if it were a, what a, as if it were a bench, like as if it had no more reality than a rock, you know, for this person. I, I treated that person like the same as I treated the piece of concrete next to them. Like I didn't differentiate that they were really a person, you know, who wants to be happy just as much as I do. Right? And then you bring up the person where when you think of them, you immediately your face goes like that, you know, like you know. So you just think like you think of this person's face and you're like, oh, you know. So that's the person you put right in front of you to meditate. Does that make sense when you get to the end? You know, you don't pick somebody, like, you don't say, you know, and, and don't, like, or it's just because it's like, you know, uh, somebody else thinks of somebody as an enemy, that's not enough, right? That's the person where you really feel a sense of, ugh, like, you know, that kind of feeling, or anger, or, like, disgust, or annoyance, and you put them right in front of you to meditate. Does that make sense? Like, or to really train your mind, you have to develop compassion in that way. You know? And you really focus on, okay, are they suffering or not? You know, and you do, and you, and the other point I want to make is you, you do this over time, right? So what's going to happen is, if you do this over time, is then, like, then it's great, when the, you know, that you, like, go to work and somebody's treating you bad. Right? It's like, oh, good. Now you have something to meditate on, you know, like. Um, or, you know, like, you get in a fight with your best friend or something, right? It's like, good. That's the time to meditate on compassion, right? And you sit and you meditate on their suffering, right? Like, that person who's treating you bad, right? You know, and that person who's treating me good, all of them. You know, the person I don't care about. You, each one, you're focusing on, oh, how are they suffering, right? And what's really going on for them, right? So you're developing also empathy and then compassion. Um, and if you do it enough, right? I've said this before. If you do it enough, then of course what's going to happen is, like, it'll be funny, right? The person who was in the, uh, like, uh, like, wow, this person was in the stranger category. Now they're in the friend category. Oh, they were in the stranger and friend. Now they're in the enemy category. Oh wait, now they're back in the friend category. Right, then eventually the friend becomes a stranger again. You know, if you do it long enough, you start to realize, you know, the teaching on equanimity says that will happen, but if you do it long enough, you'll realize, oh no, they were right, it really does. You know, because that's the nature of samsaric, you know, and again, like, we sometimes think, oh, pe like, we blame it on other people, right? Like, oh, they're, you know, when they're doing good, we say we don't blame anything. We say, oh, they're our friend, they're wonderful. Right? And then, like, if they become an enemy, we say, oh, they're terrible, how could they do that to me? They betrayed me. And then, then if they become, like, a stranger again, we, we say, you know, they neglected me, they don't even care about me, or so, right? But part of what this is getting at is that, no, that's just the nature of samsaric relationships. Like, Buddhas don't have that experience. For Buddhas, everybody's their friend, right? Dalai Lama goes around, right, we said that. Dalai Lama goes around, everybody's his brother and sister, right? Wherever he goes, he comes to, you know, he comes to a place for the first time, you know, he's like, right, he's hugging whoever, you know. Right? And if you, I notice that when he comes to D.C., right, like, you know, he's, um, what's he say, right? He hugs... Republicans and Democrats alike, you know, he's trying to, he doesn't have like a, you know, he's one of the few people who, and, and who both Republicans and Democrats really are fond of him, you know, it's like there aren't that many people like that, right, and he's one of those people. Anyway, so my point is, you know, that's the nature of samsaric relationships, there is as long as we're in samsara, we are always like, they're changing, right, relationships, we went through that in the suffering of samsara, there's a suffering of like, things always change, nothing's reliable, so here, you don't blame other people, you recognize, of course that's happening, because we're in samsara, we're suffering. You know, and these people are suffering, so that's why they sometimes appear like this and sometimes appear like that. But we stop labeling them in that. You know, we, or we don't, as they say, we don't stop labeling them. You stop believing your labels. Does that make sense? You no longer believe that a stranger is really a stranger. Right? Because then you have that experience, like, you know, like somebody you really adore, right? And then you realize, oh, we were in the same place like five times before. We didn't, like, I walked right past you, right? You know, and it's like, well, that's that. Right? That's the stranger. And it's like, you know, like, wow, like, how can I, you know, you, you almost feel like, how can I have walked past you? I love you so much. How can I have just passed right by you, you know? Well, that's samsara, right? It'll happen again, you know? <laughs> in a future life, you'll walk right past them again, you know? 
that kind of thing. Um, so that's the idea here. So you actually have, have to pick real people and meditate on them. Yeah. Um, so going back to putting like the <clears throat> like sort of like your worst enemy in front of you and like kind of like a real person, not like yeah. someone like lived 500 years ago yeah. or something like that. Just, so if at that point you're <clears throat> You're having like you're struggling to develop anything. Yeah. You're like you're just, you know, it's not working or something right. like that, right? So, so what are you supposed to do? Go, do you try to work further into? Do you pray or do you go back to uh, uh, the neutral sort of feelings or or or, or meditating when you know those close to you? You know, like you know the, the friends, enemies, and uh, fr friends. A stranger, an enemy. So you're an enemy at that point. So would you go back to, to, to the stranger meditation, or you go back to the friend med meditation? Or? You could do. Uh, first of all, yes, if you could do that. But I have another suggestion for what it's worth. Like just from my own experience, like I think what can be helpful at that time. Well, and one thing is you can't just go back. In other words, if it's too overwhelming, like if it's like I just can't do it right now, then go back. To, you know, it's okay to go back. Like in other words, let's say let's say somebody made you so angry that you like can't do it that day with them. Then you may say, okay, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> you don't want to calm down. And I'll go back to the neutral person or friend, and I'll, I'll do that tomorrow. But we can't put it off forever. It's one, you know, so we get, it's, there are days where you're just like, I can't handle it today. And that's fair. You know, like, but then there's a, uh, but eventually we have to come back to that person and do it. And then um, part of the idea would be this, would be, you know, that's where one applies, like, I think that's the time in, the, in one's meditation to apply all the teachings from the mind training tradition, the Lojong tradition, right? So, or is there are many, many points then. Like, you know, so one would be, one would be if you're using the things from this, right? You would actually think, you would stop and you would actually go back to past lives. One thing, right? You could say, okay, so right now that person is appearing like this, and I can't stand them. But, wow, like it's hard to get to it. But I mean, if, when you're ready, you could go back and say, wow, this person was actually in some past life they were my mom, and they held me close to them, and they fed me, and they, you know, and like all that, right? That's one. Then there's another one, which is like, you know, of course, the, now I'm leaving the, the, this particular long rim topic and going to right. Lojong. Mm -hmm. But in Lojong, right, there's this idea that, um, where it's like, and actually, just, this, is in, this is in the mind training teachings, but actually one can do it really in this life also. It's hard, but actually, but to say, like, I, <laughs> it's actually useful. Like, so sometimes if, if you're really mad at somebody, right, because they did something that you don't like, to say, like, to stop and say, all right, how did I contribute to that situation? Like, what did I do? And again, like, to be honest, if you, if you do that in the moment, you'll think, nothing. It was all, <laughs> you know. Um, but then to realize, well, okay, you know, uh, from a Buddhist perspective, Buddhist teachings would say that's impossible. Or, um, because of interdependence, right, because of karma. And, and, and in this life and also in past life, like, it's impossible. That, that there, there was relationships are such that, you know, like, um, you know, Shanti David gives that uh, example right, where he says, like, um, he says, if somebody hits me with a stick, should I be mad? Like, if somebody hits me in the head with a stick, should I be mad at the stick, at my head, or at the other person? Right? Uh, you know, and it's sort of like, because I had to have a head, first of all. You know, like, uh, to get hit, there had to be a stick, and there had to be another person, all three. You know, so it's interdependent. You know, so like, or his, his point being like, nothing's all 100% uh, that other person. You know, so I'm just giving different examples. So one would have to sort of meditate on all those different kinds of topics, like, you know, so there's all the teachings on Shanti Deva, right? Like, then on the kindness of the stra of the enemy, and on how, like, I'll never become enlightened if I can't, you know, like that idea. Uh, if I can't include this person in my compassion, then I'm not really practicing. You know, it's like that's um, what you say, right? That's a core spiritual practice. So actually, I, like this is the this is the, in a way the most important one to meditate on compassion for, because that difficulty, that's how people actually progress. You know, and um, and also like one can I even say like. The compassion I'm having for the friend and the stranger, like that might still be a little bit infected with my own egotism, you know. But if I can develop compassion for this person, I'll know it's pure, because they're not giving me any ego uh, enhancements or something like that. So if I can develop compassion for them, then I know actually I'm developing a kind of pure compassion. You know, it's almost like when you, I don't say, you know, like the water that comes from like the top of a mountain or something. You know, it's like the really pure. Version. Like, so I'm just giving different examples where one can sort of contemplate different points, you know, and then one can, like, where eventually one can come to the point like, oh, that's the one, you almost feel like that's the person I most want to develop compassion for, like, that's the one that's the most, the most enthusiasm or something like that, you know, but you have to think of the benefits, is my point, in a way, like, to think, 
you know, like, oh, this is the person who, you know, Lama Zobarishi says, oh, that's the person who's leading me most to enlightenment. There's my, you know, he, he gives that example. He says, there's my, my Lama, and there's the person who's harming me, and they're the two who are the most important ones to meditate on sometimes, like for spiritual practice, you know. Um, again, let's go back to your point, that doesn't mean to be a victim and be a doormat with them and stay around all the time, but because it's not about the behavior, it's about the inner, you know, I mean, I just want to point that out. Like, it's not to go, oh, so now go back and let them mistreat me day and day and, you know, over and over. It's not to pre pretend that's not true. So it's not that, right, but it's at an internal level to say, if I'm going to try to train my mind, that's the important, uh, they're one of the important helpful people or something like that, you know. So I'm just saying, like, one can think of all the benefits, one can think about past lives, one can think about future lives and how, you know, like, the Buddha only became the Buddha because of he had enemies himself, right? David Dato was told, didn't like him, even after he became a Buddha. Uh, you know, and so, like, so on. So, like, you know, there are many different points one can meditate on. Yeah. But to recognize, like, that's a really, actually, you know, but again, I, I think you have to be practical with ourselves. Like, there is, if, if we're really overwhelmed, we realize, oh, the more I think about that, I'm just going to become more and more enraged, and I'm not gonna, it's not going to work, then I have to say, okay, I'll wait till tomorrow or the next day, or wait until... Um, you know, wait until I've calmed down enough to do it. So, I mean, there are times like that. So, I mean, one has to judge for oneself. But then, but, but the idea being like that one has to, you know, one would ideally feel or cultivate this idea or approach, but like, but I really do want to meditate on that because that's, it's going to help my own practice. Actually. It's not, you know, it's not about the other person, actually. It's going to help me, you know, in that sense. It'll also help them indirectly if they happen to be around me, then I'll be a little less jerk towards them. But, uh, but mostly it's for my own training, in a way, you know, at this point, at, at, anyways, at this first yeah. at preliminary stage. Yeah. So at that point, one one needs to add uh, apply other methods. Yeah. If necessary. Yeah, and so I would look in like you know Shanti Deva's guide to the Wisdom Way of Life, the section on patience, and also in the Seven Point Mind Training, there are tons of like contemplations for the enemy mm -hmm. uh, that are very helpful. Really, you know, so one might want to apply those first and then get to this. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so actually, <laughs> that's funny. The point I just made is in the next paragraph. I just really, I, 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 that's funny. So this whole point about you need to look at real people. You know, pick real people and apply it to them. Otherwise, it's not going to really cha uh, change your mind much. Right? Um, so he says, is there, this is a very important point because if you start in training to train in observing sentient beings in general, right, some sort of in generic sense of sentient beings, without dividing them into specific categories of real people, uh, uh, it will appear that it does not arise, you know, so in other words, um, not much will happen, is what he's saying. It won't really lead to tr inner transformation. Um, and so that's an important point. And in other words, if you can do that, and I guess I want to make more point with that, psychologically speaking. Whereas the point being this, if you can really do it with a few examples of friends, enemies, and strangers, you're not going to have to do it with everybody, right? But if you can, like, transform your mind with, like, you know, over the course of a few months with, like, you know, using a few examples of who's your friend, enemy, and stranger at that phase of your life, and you really get good at it, then it will become easy down the road. Does that make sense? Then there will come times where, like, somebody else comes along, a new person you never met before who treats you badly, but because your mind is trained, it will be much easier. Does that make sense? So, like, and in that sense, you'll actually look back at the people who were your enemy back then, and you'll say, oh, they really helped me, because now, when somebody treats me badly, I, my mind is... Uh, more easily at peace. Does that make sense? Uh, so the idea is that uh, you have to use real people. And if you get good at doing it with real people in your life now, then your mind will be easier, have an easier time doing it in the future. And easier and easier until eventually you'll realize actual great compassion. Uh, and then he says, you have to think about, in, in, when meditating on compassion for others, right, which means the wish for them to be free from suffering, this is that point I was making earlier, you have to be willing to look at their suffering. Does that make sense? Because if you don't look at the suffering that others experience, how are you going to develop compassion for it? Right? So you have to actually contemplate that. And he says, you can use the same points from the middle scope. Remember in the middle scope, there were like the different sufferings of samsara, right? There were the general suffering of samsara and the specific suffering. So you know, he says, here, you can apply those to these people. If earlier, you were applying it to yourself, right? You were saying, I go through this kind of suffering, I go through that kind of suffering. Here, you take those same points and you apply it to others, right? So you look at others and you think about you know, all the different kinds of suffering they go through. And if you do that, of course, um, it'll be inconceivable, right? There is, like, the amount of suffering that people experience, you know. And if you think about it, right, there is anybody you meet, right, what kind of suffering have they already met with? 
what kind of suffering are they having now and what kind of suffering will they have in the future, it's huge, right? It's humongous. Actually, maybe I'll share, I'm going to go off on just a very short tangent. For that, I sometimes think of this story uh, of the Buddha. It's actually a story where um, a woman, uh, a woman's child died. And um, she was, as most people who've lost children would be, was utterly overwhelmed right, with grief and despair and um, anger and, you know, all those kinds of emotions. Um, I sometimes, you know, I, I sometimes reflect on that. Like, I sometimes, I sometimes just from my own, my, uh, maybe there are of this kind of thing. I, I sometimes thought that the suffering of, it was a woman, so a mother who's lost their child, sometimes seems like the worst suffering uh, in the human realm. That's been my own experience so far. Like, uh, I've never seen anybody suffer as much as a mother who lost their child. So this woman was one, a mother like that. And she was, she kind of lost her mind temporarily and was carrying her child's corpse around going up to people and saying, can you bring him back to life? Can you bring him back to life? She was just sort of crazed, you know, overwhelmed with grief. And she went, she, eventually <laughs> she heard about the Buddha. And so she showed up at the Buddha. You know, she, somebody said, oh, he's like the most enlightened person. And so she showed up the, at the Buddha, to the Buddha with the corpse of her child and said, people say you're enlightened. Bring my child back to life. Um, and, uh, and the Buddha said, um, the Buddha kind of, uh, the Buddha said, Leave, I think he said something like, uh, you know, leave the body with me and take this cup. And he said, and, um, bring me a cup of rice from a family who's known no suffering, and I'll bring your child back to life. Um, and so she, um, she took, she, you know, desperately took the cup and went running, you know, and, and started going from house to house, you know, in, uh, I don't know which town in India it was. Um, and she would say, you know, I'm looking for a house where there's there's been no suffering. You know, uh, to borrow some to have some rice. You know, and of course each house she went to, the family invited her in and said, well, "I'm sorry, but we've had suffering." And the, you know, she told them her story and they told her their story of suffering. And then she went to the next house. She said, "I lost my child and I'm looking for rice." And then, and of course they told her their story of suffering. And um, I think she must have gone to a lot of houses because she was pretty desperate. Um, and eventually. And she reached a point where she realized, first of all, I'm never going to find a house with no, uh, no suffering. Um, but she also came to understand what the Buddha was, you know, the Buddha had, had set this task as a, as a sort of experiential teaching for her, right? about, you know, hearing the suffering of others, you know, and facing that and recognizing, I'm, it wasn't to minimize her suffering, but it was to recognize my suffering is not different, right? In other words, we're all suffering. The sense of really, that's where facing one's own suffering and the suffering of others and she came back uh, to the Buddha and um, gave him back his cup, and said, and uh, and they had a discussion then. You know, she was ready then to have this talk with the Buddha, and he, um, you know, he pointed out to her the nature of samsara, right? The nature of, how, you know, the nature of how we all suffer and are all worthy of compassion. And then they say uh, she entered the spiritual path and became enlightened. You know, became arhat, I think, in that life. Right. I think it was arhat. She, became, she gave her spirit, great spiritual realization. So the point being, like, we have to be willing, you know, to face the suffering of ourselves and others, right? And, and that was the order, if you notice her story. First she had to, she was very aware of her own suffering. And then she was able to face the suffering of others. And then that became the basis for compassionate spiritual practice. Does that make sense? I, so I, I often think of that story, because it's like, we have to be willing to, to hear the stories of others' suffering, you know? And sometimes we can literally hear them by asking. Um, and sometimes it's like, in our meditation, we can just, you know, it, or it doesn't, it's oftentimes not that mysterious, right? So, so you actually meditate on the suffering of others, that's the thing. So you actually sit down and you think of these different people, right? Your friends, your enemies, strangers, and all beings. But you go through it and you think, well, what suffering are they going through? Does that make sense? And by thinking about their suffering, it enhances your feeling of understanding and empathy and then compassion. So, um, and then he makes a point, and this answers a question you asked Gabe a while back. You, know, you said, well, how do you know when you've made progress or something like that? And so he says that he quotes actually uh, Kamala Shila here in his uh, Stages of Meditation Days. He says, at the point where the compassion that has the aspect of the constant desire to remove the suffering of all beings, as if your own beloved child was unhappy, operates naturally in you, spontaneously, and operates according with your own nature, it is complete. 
Therefore, that obtain, it obtains the name great compassion. So there he's giving the answer, right? And so like, actually, I'll, I'll say, I mean, you know, like, so, I mean, you're, you're a father, right? So you know, like, whereas when, you know, when your daughter is having a really hard time, that feeling you have of compassion, wanting to relieve her of that, right? So he's saying, you know, you think of that feeling you have for your own daughter, then you recognize when you feel that, the way, you know, when you're particularly aware, like when she's had the worst day, and you're aware of it, and how you feel on that day, he's saying when you feel that level of compassion for all beings all the time, naturally, then you've realized great compassion. So that's actually a very direct answer to that question. Um, and so he says that, then he elaborates, he says, thus, compassion towards all sentient beings naturally arises to the extent, you know, it, it sort of, it, in other words, it's no longer, because this is that point I was making at that time when you asked the question. At first, it's through, what's the word? It's like, what was the word you used? Uh, I said um, contrive. Contrive, meaning like at the beginning, our compassion sort of takes effort. We have to sort of push ourselves. We have to sort of, you know, contemplate and sort of imagine and meditate, and we give rise to compassion. And that's progress. That's that's how we progress. And he says if you do that over and over again, there will come a point where it's like a like natural, like the flow of a river. Almost, right? Like a river is always flowing, you know, like a, you know, like the um, like the Mississippi or the Hudson River, you know, big river. It's always flowing, right? When your compassion is like that, that it's just always flowing naturally and experientially, then you'll, um, then you'll give it rise to great compassion. And that's, the, that's, that's the goal for this meditation. You keep meditating on compassion until you give rise to that kind of inner experience um, where it becomes spontaneous and natural. Um, and again, uh, and Lomas Mekhan will explain this more later, but the idea in Buddhism, of course, is that anything, actually this is an important point, anything you know, you might say, oh, that, like, oh, that almost seems impossible or something. But here is that anything's possible, actually. Like, it was with our minds. And I'll just say that. You know, that's really true. You know, like, um, I sometimes um, reflect on this. Like, I sometimes say this, actually. You know, like, uh, you know, I, I've said this before. I work as a psychologist. Right? So, like, sometimes I work, like, in, the way, in, in our culture, we're actually familiar with this idea that anything's possible and that our state can become limitless and habitual and continual. But we're familiar with what negative states of mind. Does that make sense? Like, actually, we all, like, there is, you probably have met people. Like, like, you know, so in other words, like, so for example, like somebody who has a severe anxiety and panic attacks, right? Like they've, not intentionally, but their mind has become habituated, right? To anxiety, where they, they've, you know, sort of thought, this can go wrong, that can go wrong, this can be bad, that can be bad. You know, and they've thought about it so much that it becomes limitless, right? Where, like somebody who's having a panic attack, they literally can't breathe, right? They, like, can fa they can faint or they start sweating. That, and their whole body is reacting to, to a kind of overwhelming, almost experientially for them, infinite sense of, of anxiety, right? Or the same thing like we were familiar with, like major depression, right? Where somebody's experience is like, you know, like there is, no matter what's going on around them, everything feels, appears horrible to them, right? Ter like absolutely terrible, right? Or like rage, right? You've probably met somebody like that, right? Like we're is they allow their mind to become so habituated to anger, you know, that like, you know, that somebody just saying one wrong phrase, right, and they're like, ah, you know, like, a, like exploding, right, like, like, you know, and, and being violent or something like that, right? Like, we all know that's possible, right? Like, in other words, and we all know that. Like, you, if you know, if you, first of all, you probably know people in your own life, and if you watch, like, the news, you can see there's people in the world, oh, of course, all kinds of things like that, right, where, like, our mind is not by nature, whereas human beings don't have a nature of, like this, of limitless rage, but of course people give rise to that. There are people, you know, we all know there are people in the world who they, habitu they allow their mind, let's say, to get habituated to that, and eventually their mind is like limitless rage, right? Or like the same thing with those others, right? Anxiety, you know? Like it's not, it's nobody's nature to be chronically anxious, but there are people who, it's true, right? Like they let, they, they've somehow gotten habituated, let's put it that way, right? Where then like they go to sleep feeling anxious, as soon as they wake up they're feeling anxious, and then like any trigger in their anxiety becomes like, you know, like some people never leave their home, right? It's called agoraphobia, right? The person will never leave their house because they're so anxious. You know, and like, just the idea, if you said, oh, let's go out to get milk at the grocery store, they would like, experience like this, like, what's the word, like a limitless sense of overwhelming anxiety. You know, so that's not to be critical, it's just what happens. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, um, it can happen to the human mind, right? So what Buddhism is saying is like, I sometimes use this phrase, like, what would it be like to have a, a rage of compassion? Or a compassion attack, you know, uh, <laughs> like that. You know, like that's it, we don't imagine that, right? But that's what Buddhism is suggesting, right? That's what this teaching is suggesting. Whereas you can come and habituate to anything. So what this is saying is, if you're going to become habituated to something, make it compassion. That's the best thing to become habituated to. There's nothing better in the world. Like 
they say that the Buddha, not in just this world, actually, they say, they say the Buddha searched the universe, you know, for eons, and found that there's no better thing in the universe than compassion. You know, there's nothing better for your mind than compassion. Um, you know, the Tibetan word for compassion is Ning J. So Ning is heart, Ning means heart, and J is like exalted. So they mean, like, even the Tibetan word for compassion means the most exalted state of your heart. It's like the highest state that anybody can cultivate uh, of their heart, uh, the most wonderful. You know, that's it. So the idea is your mind can become habituated to anything, actually. It's true. You know, like, there was like, um, desire. Yeah, desire, right? Like, and then, like, you know, have you ever had that state, like, where you're like, you know, I mean, if you've been addicted to a substance, but also it could be addicted to like a, you know, if you're like, what's the word? You know, like, if you're just obsessed, you know, like, I mean, probably everybody's had that. You know, if you're like totally obsessed with whether it be like an object or a thing or another person, right? Where like, you can't ever get it out of your mind, right? Like, even in your dreams, it's like there, you can't sleep, and like, you wake up, and you know what I mean? Like, that state of mind where you're like, it's always there, right? You can't escape from it. You know, so we're all familiar with it. <laughs> the problem is we're all familiar with that with the negative state. Um, what Buddhism is suggesting, what Lama Tsongkhapa and the Buddha and all these teachers are suggesting, is you can do that same thing with positive states. Does that make sense? Where, like, you know, as you're going to sleep, you're overwhelmed with love, compassion. Right? And that's a very peaceful. Overwhelmed is almost the wrong word, though, because it's peaceful. Right? Compassion by its nature is a powerful, peaceful, Actually, the Dalai Lama points this out. Compassion has this aspect of being, of, of sort of, it's a mind that's both peaceful and brave and strong and has a kind of joy, energy to it, you know, confidence to it. Um, so compassion, in this sense, is not a weak state of mind. It's like a very powerful state uh, that can face anything, actually, right? Whereas compassion, actually, that's interesting, right? Compassion can face this kind of compassion that he's talking about. First of all, it's incredibly powerful, but it can, it can face any kind of difficulty. It's a kind of, this kind of compassion also, a person who cultivates this state of mind, if you think about it also, like, let's just say, right, they are embracing, right, because there's, the world is filled with, with uh, suffering, right? So the person with this kind of state of mind is fearless. In other words, they're totally in the present moment, right? They're not afraid of their own, in other words, this person is not afraid of their own suffering. They recognize that's part of life, and in other words, I can face that with awareness. And they're not afraid of others' suffering, right? They're not afraid of difficulty. They just embrace, you know, uh, John Kabat-Zinn uses this phrase from um, Zorba the Greek. He said, the full embrace the full catastrophe of life, right? He called it full catastrophe. He named his first book Full Catastrophe Living. But it's like, life is a catastrophe, is the point. Um, samsara is a catastrophe, right? There is a, that's the nature of people. That's, a, that's why I told that story about the woman who went door to door with the cup, right? Whereas every house has its catastrophe. You know, every family has its catastrophe. Every person has their catastrophe. Um, but this kind of compassion, right, um, fearlessly and lovingly and warmly embraces um, oneself and others in the context of the catastrophe. Does that make sense? So there's a kind of fearlessness and a kind of, what's the word, like fully embracing life with an open heart. You know, I'm just sort of elaborating on what Lama Sankapa is saying. Does that make sense? So like, and, and the... If, if happiness makes one, if, if love makes one happy, compassion is said to even be more powerful in leading to happiness in this life and in future lives. Um, so there's a sense of also confidence then. There is that if, you, if you're embracing yourself and others and whatever is arising with compassion, um, in this life you can handle whatever arises. It's going to be okay. You know, we all have things we're afraid of, right? Like there is like, you know, maybe death, maybe like infirmity, illness. Right, disability, compassion sort of recognizes those are all part of, there is somebody, you know, I'm going to have some kind of suffering, and so is everybody else I know, right? And so, like, if we don't have compassion, we're afraid of that. We're sort of, like, avoiding, like we're sort of, some part of us is pulling back and trying to protect ourselves by hiding. But you can't hide from life, right? So compassion says, no, embrace life. Embrace, you know, and, and when good things are happening, you have love, wishing for more good for others, right? And yourself, you know, when, you have, when difficulties arise, you have compassion that embraces that. Um, does that make sense? I'm just sort of elaborating on what Lama Tsongkhapa is saying here. So the compassion has a kind of quality of, of like energetically and with contentment and peace and energy and confidence, sort of embracing others and embracing life and embracing um, 
you know, whatever is happening. Right? And recognizing you're not alone. Actually, you can never be alone. Does that make sense? Like compassion, that woman in the story with the cup, right? Whereas if you understand compassion, you're ne- you know, the, uh, you're, you recognize you never are alone, you never were alone, you never will be alone. In the sense that everybody's together in suffering. We're all interrelated and interdependent. And we all suffer together. And we can hide from each other or hate each other or we can embrace each other, not physically, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, in the spirit of compassion. Does that make sense? I'm just sort of, again, I'm going off on a tangent. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple different points. Like, like one is, um, say it the right way. Like, I think there are various. I, I mean, uh, Lama Sakaba doesn't go into this much detail, but I'll just say my own thoughts on it. Like, one, and the Dalai Lama often points this out, so I agree with you. But I'm going to add another point. So the point that first I'll say that, like, the Dalai Lama often makes this point. He points this. Point, he makes this point that, um, you know, obviously we can't. Like, we're not omnipotent. We can't. Nobody, even the Buddha, is not omnipotent. So we can't. Like, we can't force others not to suffer. We can't force others not to make bad decisions. You know, we, we don't have that power. But this sense of, um, so one point is what you're saying, the sense of that, that there comes a, a kind of level, the Dalai Lama says, kind of a sense of like, he, sometimes he says things like satisfaction and purpose and, and sort of, um, you know, deep meaning and deep sense of, of uh, contentment, really, in knowing one is doing everything one can. You know, like, like the sense of, if I'm, the, the sort of sense of satisfaction that comes from saying, you know, people were suffering and I tried to help. I was there with them. Um, you know, there's a sense of kind of, so that, that's one, is what you're saying. The sense of, you know, that, that one is doing what one can to help. There's that, that's, that's one sense of contentment. Um, but then I think also there's another thing too, which I'll just add, which is the sense of also, um, you know, at the beginning, I think at the very beginning, if we haven't empathized before with a certain kind of suffering, there is a sense that one can, it can be like almost scary or overwhelming or difficult or something. But then um, part of what's getting, I think, uh, what, what comes eventually, I think, and, it, and again, it's not addressed directly here, but it's implied maybe, is this sense of um, eventually having this a kind of confidence and understanding or knowing that one's own mind and heart are big enough. There is that, that uh, you know, I'm going to use a metaphor just for a second. Like, if, um, let's see, so sure, like, if one has like a small vessel, like a, let's say, let's say I had like a little, this cup or something like that, right? And then somebody took a giant, um, <laughs> actually I'll use the metaphor somebody used, said to me the other day. So if I had this cup and I said, I want to fill this up with liquid, and then like a helicopter came in, like one of those helicopters they use to fight forest fires, and dumped like the entire, uh, its entire content, you know, the firefighting in contents, like all that, into the cup. Like, actually, it's not going to fill the cup because the cup would be washed away, right? Like, um, like, the cup would be filled for an instant and then it would get, you know, knocked over and it would flow away with all the uh, liquid. So it would get overwhelmed, you know, because it's small. Right? But if that same helicopter, filled with like firefighting water, right, water to fight a fire, were to drop that water into the Pacific Ocean, um, the Pacific Ocean wouldn't get overwhelmed, right? Uh, in other words, it would, be, it would be the same as a drop. It was like whether you dropped like one dropper's worth into the Pacific Ocean or the entire helicopter's worth, the Pacific Ocean is not going to uh, be knocked over at all. Like. And I think, so I guess my, I'm just using that metaphor to make a point that I think what happens over, like at the beginning, our experience, I think, can be like the cup. Does that make sense? Like we feel like I'm small and this is overwhelming and it's big to me and it feels like sort of, 
it can feel frightening, it can feel, but then um, gradually I think what happened uh, that's sort of uh, is that one's one's exoter one's inner experience should eventually becomes a kind of more like like that you're like the ocean, or is that um that there's space and there's room, you know, and that one it's not one doesn't feel it less the sense of empathy, but it's like one has a sense of um, the goal I think or a goal or a kind of implication here is that. Uh, so it's not that like when you're with a person who's suffering that there's a sense of, oh, well, it's just one drop in the ocean, not that. But an internal sense that one has room. Does that make sense? That there's a spaciousness and a room so that it's not overwhelming to embrace the suffering of others. Um, and that happens gradually, I think, over the course of, well, I guess ultimately over eons maybe, but, <laughs> uh, you know, over, over a long period of time, over time, uh, depending on the person, you know, um, you know, or maybe over years. <laughs> more, more optimistic uh, version. But does that make sense? So like, I think that's another version of a kind of confidence, is the sense of having space. Um, and part of, I think, what I just make that point, because like, part of what part of what makes it hard to have the space is, and uh, this is really true, like, to the extent that either, you know, either that we feel, you know, like, oh, I can't handle it, or, or we feel threatened by the suffering, or we feel a sense of, you know, I'm afraid of that suffering for myself, or I'm afraid that's suffering for the people I care about, or I don't know what to do, or, you know, there's all these different versions that sort of, that are actually, in a way, our own sense of self, or even ego or something, kind of getting in the way, or, you know, making it smaller, making our mind small. But as that sort of, as we relax that and open that, the mind becomes bigger, or vaster. You know, we, I mean, actually, it always was, in a way. We were just able to contact, we are able to be in touch with the vastness of our own mind, or something like that. It, it creates a more sense of space to then have the empathy. And again, I think it's normal, though. It's a gradual process. And um, to say, right, you know, you can look, like, you know, when you look at the activity, like, of bodhisattvas, right, then you start to see, oh, wow, they're really like that. In other words, we're like, you know, but actually, I'll, I'll share one more story. As I, I'm going slower today because I'm sharing stories, but okay if I share one more story related to what you're saying. I found this, I, I personally I found this story numerous times in my life touching and helpful to me personally. But it's the story of Avalokiteshvara, right, who, the Bodhisattva of compassion, who um, the Dalai Lama said to be a, an emanation of. Right? And there's a famous story that uh, Avalokiteshvara was a Bodhisattva, and he was um, practicing great compassion, this topic. And he was working for the welfare of others, sort of expressing his great compassion by helping, helping beings practice the Dharma. And um, they say he did that for a long period of time, uh, and he made a oh, he, and he had made a vow like if I ever give up my he, re, he reached a point where he took the bodhisattva vow that he was practicing compassion and he, did, and he said if I ever give up my vow may my head split into a thousand pieces, you know and um and then he worked for others for like many many years, and there came a point where he paused and he looked around, and he had this sense that although I've been helping others for a long time, there are just as much suffering in the world just as many beings suffering as there were before, it looks like. You know, it looks like I haven't made a dent in all of the suffering. And he got overwhelmed by the empathy with others suffering, and he thought, um, I can't do it. You know? And when that happened, his head burst into a thousand pieces because he had made that vow. And he was sort of laying there with his head in a thousand pieces. Uh, not dead, but just sort of like, uh, miserable suffering, you know, uh, suffering great pain. Uh, and then they say that his guru was Amitabha Buddha, his teacher, you know, and they say Amitabha Buddha came and, um, and basically said like, kind of like, don't worry my child, like, I'm here with you and you've done a good job helping others. And then he, he healed him, but he healed him in the form, I don't think we have it here, that's where the, um, actually the form of Avalokiteshvara that the Dalai Lama is associated with, it has um, a, uh, 11 heads and a thousand arms, and each arm has an, an eye in the palm. That's right. Is there one here? Oh yeah, there's a little satsa. Yeah, so he has eleven heads and a thousand, a thousand hands you know, uh, that all reach out, and each hand has an eye in it. So this is a, this is him. So these are like the thousand arms and the eleven heads, uh, and he has you know, and he's standing there with, um, and he's holding certain implements. But so they say that what happened? Was, I guess his head broke into eleven pieces and his body broke into a thousand. Sorry, I got that wrong. Um, but so they say that what uh, what Amitabha. Uh, you know, Amitabha healed him and said, but uh, as he healed him, he became this form, 
this sort of celestial form of the Bodhisattva. And part of the idea is like, it's interesting, right? Like, or is, well, you know, what's the meaning of 11 heads and a thousand arms? Like, you know, uh, but in a way, it's this metaphor that his, he had, now he has over a thousand eyes, right? So in other words, he has an awareness that's vaster. Does that make sense? Like, it's this metaphor, I think, or an image to embody that. So he, he developed a kind of awareness that was much more vast than what he had before. And uh, the 11 heads, right? He could see in all different directions. He could sort of, whereas he was no longer limited in the way that ordinary beings are limited. He no longer had a kind of, an ordinary, what's the word? His body reflected the lack of ego, really, right? The sense of, of an awareness that's so vast, right? And then the thousand arms, though, also that he could help. You know, whereas he could see, um, he had a mind that was as vast enough to embrace the suffering without getting overwhelmed, and then he naturally could express help through it in a thousand ways, you know, where we could only have two, you know. Um, so I think that, I, always th I often think of that story in the sense of, it's normal to get overwhelmed in moments. You know, it's also not to pathologize, it's like, Avalokiteshvara did, you know, and Amitabha was okay with it. You know, it's the sense of, uh, that's a normal part of the process as one is sort of developing, is the way I take that story. But that, that it's not a sign to give up, it's not a sign, it's a sign that, you know, over time, with the help of the teachings and the teacher and the practice, one's awareness will be, you know, that our awareness, you know, including myself, that, that our awareness has to become gradually develop and become more vast and spacious, and, and that with that will come the thousand arms, so to speak, you know, the ability to help more and more. Um, so I think that story sort of, it, to me, embodies part of an answer yeah, to that. I'm not, you mentioned that story, are you something like, yeah, I was thinking of Mother Teresa as you were talking too, right? Um, right. And at first, like one child, right? I mean, one or one uh, homeless person or one, right, with with um, leprosy would be, you know, really it could be a marrow, right? Like, but then over time, it's the sense of right, an awareness, and then in her case, you know, and like, and also other people showed up, right? Uh, other nuns, other volunteers, but but it was a sense, of, you know, and, and this point about. And also, she made that point. I thought it was very beautiful. She made that point. You know, it, it's, um, did she say something like, it's not, it's not the issue of doing so many loving acts, is doing, it's not an issue of doing great loving acts, but of doing acts with great love. Right? Whereas it's this idea of, in the present moment, to be loving and to be aware and to be present in that way. And that that's the practice. You know, it's not, you know, her goal wasn't, or, I mean, her task wasn't to eliminate homelessness and leprosy from the planet, right? Her task was to be loving. Help them, you know, and I think that's similar in that sense of because you know, is the goal of compassion? You know, compassion doesn't eliminate. Actually, you know, as the, the Buddha perfected compassion, he didn't eliminate all the suffering in the world, right? Um, you know, so the goal is to become someone who embodies compassion in that way, and who, who whatever one comes across, one expresses that through help. Um, you know, but there is we we also you don't confuse it with our some omnipotence that ability to sort of magically take away all this stuff, you know, there's not, there's not that sense of that we're supposed to somehow, that we're actually, there's a recognition is impossible. Actually. Does that make sense? Kind of. But it's not impossible to train one's mind to become able to embrace that. Other questions or comments? Um, so that was, actually, that was the section on Compassion. Maybe I'll briefly start just on the next topic, which is uh, meditating. So, after compassion, right, and the seven point cause and effect method, we're up to that was number six, so we're up to number seven now, the last um, cause. Uh, and then the effect is bodhicitta, right? So, the last cause is what he calls here the extraordinary <coughs> attitude. Um, and you can only develop the extraordinary attitude after developing all those other what, love and So he says, having meditated on love and compassion in this manner, right? So you first have to do those other things. Don't, if you jump to the extraordinary attitude first, it's not going to work. Um, he says, then you will think, alas, if these sentient beings who are pleasant and attractive to me are thus deprived of happiness and tormented by suffering, how shall I make them meet with happiness and how shall I free them from suffering? In taking upon yourself, at least in mere words, the responsibility to liberate them your mind is trained. So um, a couple of points he's making there, I'll just note. One is he actually reviews the whole process, right? So he says, 
you know, having viewed others, having come to appreciate others and feel gratitude to others, right? So that's, that was the, um, the first three points, right? Wishing to repay their kindness and so on. And then seeing them as deprived of happiness, that means love. Right? Seeing them as tormented by suffering, that means compassion. He says then eventually, right, if you keep meditating on the compassion aspect, and you keep thinking, I thought, I myself will free them from suffering. Right? That's the line that, we were, that you were mentioning, uh, Cynthia. Then there will come a point where you th feel, and he says, at least in words, you start to develop this sense of, that's the purpose of my existence. Right? Like, you know, the Dalai Lama has that prayer. It's, he says it's his favorite prayer from Shantideva. Right? For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Right? That's this. That's this aspiration. It's this aspiration, my purpose of existence, the purpose of my existence itself. My, I choose to make the purpose of my existence um, liberating others from suffering. Right? Uh, I take that responsibility, and I'm happy to take that responsibility. Does that make sense? That's this unit. Is it, uh, uh, something called altruism? Sometimes they call it uh, universal responsibility, um, <coughs> or the, the extraordinary or the unusual attitude of universal responsibility. Right? So in there, then this is really compassion. Naturally, if you if you meditate long enough and powerfully enough on compassion, on compassion and on bravery, and on courage, then this is a natural result of that. Eventually, right? That one sort of starts to feel, at least in mere words, he says. Right. So you start off by just feeling, thinking, okay, I've got you know, like nobody else is going to help. Like you know, I've got to do it. I've got you know, who else is going to help people? You know, you don't like what's the word? You don't put it off on other people, right? But you kind of feel and you say, uh, I take it on myself. I'm going to be. I'm going to go out and help. You know, it's like like your example, Mother Teresa, right? Like, there are a lot of people who, if they walk around in um, India, will feel some compassion for homeless or for, for somebody who's homeless or somebody with leprosy. But that's different, right? That's different from feeling, no, I, like, in other words, nobody else is doing it. I'll do it. I'll be the one to take that person and feed them and help them die peacefully, right? There's a difference between feeling, walking by and feeling, oh, I, you know, like, you know, like, uh, I'll often do that. I pass by somebody suffering and I say a prayer. Oh, may they be okay. You know, that's okay, but it's not, uh, that's not this, right? This is, this is the one of, like, you know, no, I'm taking on the responsibility. Um, and I'm happy to do it, you know? And that's why they give, they give sometimes the metaphor for this one. Like a parent, you know, like, in other words, the parent doesn't say, a good parent, like, you know, doesn't say, my child's, ha my child's uh, crying, somebody should take care of it, you know? Somebody should really deal with that, you know? <laughs> Uh, right, like that's not the attitude of a good parent. Anyway. Um, right, so you, you know, it's like you know, you know, you know it's, uh, and there's, a, there's this idea that you know, if you've done the other meditations where you feel gratitude to all beings and you feel appreciation of all beings, where it's not a burden. It's, this is not like a. At this point, the person doesn't experience it. it, was, it, it when it's not working. It was, if you meditate on this and you're feeling, well, I'm supposed to, or I should, or the Buddha said to, that's not the point. Right? The point is, it becomes a natural expression of gratitude. And appreciation and love and compassion for others. But this is talking about going beyond meditation and actually taking action then in the world of samsara. Taking the child example. If your child's crying, you can meditate on, oh, I wish happiness for the child so there's no suffering and the child stops, but in reality the child keeps crying. So then you take an action in the physical world. Is that, is that what this is implying? That you just don't meditate on it is an actual real physical action uh, well, first of all uh, to some extent yes there is it, it does you know and, and Lama Scarpa said that right there is even with love he said you know if you meditate enough on love you start acting loving right? so that would definitely apply mm -hmm. here for sure um, and then the other thing though that will come in the, in the result is that there will come a point also where the person in addition to sort of doing physical things to help will have some recognition um, like like Avalokiteshvara with the head thing, you know, there will come a point where the person will also recognize my ability to help all beings and to take and to fill that responsibility. You know, it's a bit. I guess I'll use a metaphor for a moment. It's like a parent. Uh, that one reaches the point where one's like a parent who has a ch like if, if a parent who's in poverty, right, who has children, who then says, "Wow, you know, while working my job, I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to get my degree and I'm going to, um, what's the word? I'm going to get a better job so that I can." support my kids better and, get, and pay for them to go to school and pay for them to get an education, pay for them to go to college. And all that. So in other words, one becomes like that. In that sense, when, because what I'm getting at is uh, my, my metaphor, right? While working the job means while helping others. But then going back to school and getting the degrees the, is saying bodhicitta, is saying I want to become a Buddha so then I can really help others. Does that make sense? So it's like that. Like 
So when one develops this universal, extraordinary attitude of altruism, on the one hand, one does do what you're saying, which is go out and help others, and actually you know, do things to help people. And then the other, which comes to the next point, is that one also recognizes, wow, until I, you know, so it's like the parent who's, you know, feeding and, you know, looking after their kids and doing all that, but who's saying, if I don't get education, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to get them to a better housing, for example, safe neighborhood and so on. So the parent says, all right, I'm going to go to night school you know, or something like that. So, that, you know, it's like that one sort of says, okay, I'm going to develop, I need to become a Buddha. I need to get my diploma of Buddhahood. You know, and then one does that too. So one has to do both in a sense. Um, I guess we'll stop it. So does that make sense? So, this is, I, this is, I will, so I'll, I'll, we'll pick up there next time. But So the next, that's the next step. After great compassion is this extraordinary attitude of, of uh, where one, and again, this one last point I'll make is, it's an important point though is that, is that it's not some sense of like should or yeah, like that. It, it's a sense of a natural expression of one's appreciation, gratitude, love, compassion for others, that that comes out. But okay, let's do our dedication. The supreme jewel bodhicitta, where it has not arisen, may it arise and grow. Where it has arisen, may it not decrease, but increase more and more. In the snowy mountain paradise, you, the source of good and happiness, all powerful Chinrezik Tenzing Gyatso, please remain until some sorrow. Thanks, guys.